Welcome back to the Gruber Morning Show. I'm Pete Gruber. I'm Mark Schaffner, and welcome to the uh, Roadster Roundtable podcast. The uh, image behind us, of course, since this is a Roadster podcast, is the artificial intelligence representation of a Tesla Roadster. And uh, although subtle, it does seem to be getting more accurate as time goes by. Um, so anyway, that'll be uh, uh, behind us there for the duration of this podcast. We've got a number of things to cover with you today. Uh, we've got some show and tell items, and uh, I uh, thought maybe we could open with um, Raphael de Mestri's um, uh, trek around the world the second time around with Roadster VIN number 507. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I got an email from Tessa this morning, and they were asking uh, contact information for uh, Raphael. Apparently, Raphael had contacted them and uh, wants to stop in uh, Lathrop, California. Mm-hmm. And uh, years ago, I've, you know, the first trip around the world, around 2012 or so, um, he actually got a, um, a, a party thrown for him by George Blankenship, who was one of the, um, uh, uh, the upper management types of Tesla. I think he was a national sales manager at the time. Okay. But they threw a, um, uh, they threw a party for him at the Fremont factory. So uh, this time he's going to Lathrop and... Um, I suggested, why don't you guys do that again for him? He is one of Tesla's best ambassadors. You know, and Raphael was here a couple of weeks ago to get some stickers put on his car, um, so some additional basically vinyl, and uh, looked great. Uh, had a good conversation with him that afternoon. And while we were conversing back and forth, he says, yeah, the, uh, the Tesla people at Tesla are reaching out to me this time. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to reach out to them. Very good. Strong support from Tesla, you know, and again, I have to um, give kudos to Tesla for uh, handling that battery replacement as fast as they did, because this was a car that came on a clipper ship, remember, to uh, prove again, emission-free transportation is possible, and uh, then ended up in our service center. Uh, it was upgraded, rebuilt, and Tesla put in a new 3.0 battery pack, and uh, they put them at the head of the line, and uh, that was done within a month or so. Yeah, that was really impressive. And sure. Raphael definitely uh, is an ambassador for Tesla. Uh, it was you know, truly remarkable what he did now uh, about uh, seven or eight years ago as he drove around the world in 2014. I guess that's almost nine years ago mm -hmm. uh, in that roadster, proving that electric vehicles can be viable, which really was kind of the, the whole reason that Tesla went out with the roadster in the first place was to try to prove that ele an electric vehicle could be a viable mode of transportation. And, you know, there is one other uh, Tesla ambassador like this that has been going around the world and proving that emission-free transportation is possible and viable. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to try to get this name right, even though I'm German. Hans Jörg von Gemmingen Hornberg. He um, actually went 700,000 kilometers in a Tesla Roadster. That is so impressive. I had to do the, the, the conversion. That's 435,000 miles. Miles, yeah. There are not many cars that you can even can make it that much. Yeah, yeah. And it's not the most comfortable car in the world for long-distance travel. It's an around-town type fun car, you know? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, it looks like we've got a couple people on the planet that are really pushing the envelope and uh, promoting uh, the transition to sustainable energy and transportation. Well, I also think it's uh, impressive that Raphael is going to be going at the end of next year, starting in November of 2024. Uh, it's 80edays.com if you want to go and look for more information on Raphael's uh, next journey around the world. And part of the impressive part of it to me this time is that he's taking that same 2008 Tesla Roadster, mm -hmm. which at that point will be 16 years old, and he has full confidence that he'll be able to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. The difference between back then and now is this time he has charging options. The first time around, remember, there were no charging stations. I, I do remember that. I, I always thought that uh, it was uh, intriguing for him to talk to us and say, yeah, I knew I, where I could find charging if I saw power lines going down the road. <laughs> right. And as soon as I saw a transformer, that would be the place that I would stop if I was starting to get low because I knew I would be able to get power there. And the incredible generosity of people that allowed him to tap into their electrical systems and uh, didn't charge him for that. Right. You know, this time around, he told me that the KOA, um, 
campgrounds yeah. are not as friendly toward chargers. Oh, really? Okay. Um, they, they know that there are car charging options around, and so they did not want him to just plug into an RV charger. Interesting. Yeah, yeah I thought so too. Raphael was also in the shop not too long ago. Um, while he was here, it was before you got back, Pete. Uh, we put on some new stickers. We uh, got those old uh, uh, logos from 2012-ish off mm -hmm. uh, with brand new ones that look really good. Uh, we also were able to do a little bit of an impromptu interview just about his traveling around the United States so far. Um, it isn't going to be released as a long form video, but we are going to be, ha uh, have several, uh, shorts come out of it pretty oh, soon here. Great. Okay. A, a lot of snippets, a lot of interesting stories because I mm -hmm. know he, um, he hooked up with a number of Tesla clubs, uh, the Delaware Tesla club, for example. And again, generosity, uh, one of our customers, Viviana Van Derlin, he actually, um, uh, uh, spent time at her home, had dinner there, was able to charge his car. And, uh, you know, again, it reinforces the fact that this is a close-knit community. It's, um, it is uh, definitely um, a friendly community that supports each other. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. And he had a little bit of a hiccup at a KOA uh, campground while he was out there. And that's an interesting part of the story. He found one where he was not allowed to charge. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I know he texted me from uh, while he was traveling, and at one point... He, um, he blew a circuit breaker, and he wasn't sure if anything got damaged in his charge. Um, uh, he had a U, uh, um, uh, the MC240 charge cable, which is the big, thick one, the 240 yeah. version. Yeah. And uh, it turns out that it was just a circuit breaker at a KOA campground. Maybe that's why he was uh, uh, thrown out of there. <laughs> Who knows? It's possible. <laughs> You know, we were, we're, we're going to try to do a better job of staying on top of the questions. And I was reminded by that yesterday. I guess you guys have learned that these questions usually are related to the content that we're presenting. So timeliness is important yes. because sometimes a half hour later, we're looking at and saying, what, what are they asking? You know, it was a topic from uh, 20 minutes ago or more. Yes. Um, you know, and to that, uh, to that point... Uh, Hugh, Herbert Buter on YouTube is here and saying good morning. Looking forward to interesting subjects. Uh, welcome back, Herbert. Loved seeing you uh, comment on the show. And then Alternative Energy, uh, Atia Roa. I, I think I got it right finally. You did. You did. Yeah. Atia Roa. <laughs> Atia Roa. Uh, Kia Ora from Atia Roa, New Zealand. New Zealand. All right. So we've got Germany. Herbert, by the way, is in Düsseldorf. So we're, we've got an international audience coming in. Uh, it looks like this one may be uh, U.S. based. Uh, Instagram, Methuen90, High Masters Tesla Experts. Well, thank you for joining thank us. You. Um, and then Instagram, CH215714N. Hi, Sunglass Boys. <laughs> <laughs> YouTube, Frank Martinez, 1997. Cerritos College Electronics Department worked with fiberglass programs on carbon fiber and automotive department which we take VWs and put in batteries. That was a technology and we had the T0 really, uh, and the laptop batteries changed. Uh, oh, changed everything. There we go. Yes, you're right. The first yeah. T0, uh, I was using AGM batteries, absorbent glass mat, 12 volt, uh, around 30 to 40 amp hour batteries. Right. The Optima spiral wound actually. And um, it was Martin Eberhardt that actually uh, inspired uh, and requested AC propulsion, replaced those with what, what he called laptop batteries because he was in the e-book business and that's what they were using. Right, because they, they helped uh, develop the Nook e-book that they then later sold to Barnes & Noble, if I remember right. Right. Much higher power density, and that, of course, uh, you know, uh, was the engineering idea behind this. If we can get a higher energy density into this AC propulsion T0, it's going to go farther than 80 miles. Right, right. So anyway, continuing, he says, the, um, okay, acid batteries, we were having accidents. We couldn't stop the cars. Uh, remember the AC propulsion engine and the school purchased one. We created a go-kart with six acid batteries. The thing was fast, right? <laughs> I'll bet it was. Uh, he says that he remembers the campus police wanted to know who we were. They followed us and the electronics department and we let them try the go-kart. Uh, that was probably fun for them. Oh, what a great story that is. Yeah. 
you know, and and I could see why. Uh, you know, it, you had a T zero for a short while, Pete, and mm -hmm. uh, and I'll bet it was uh, kind of an adventure to stop that thing with the weight of all those lead acid batteries in it. You know, um, the stopping was actually interesting. It had variable regen. Okay. And when you put that to its max setting, I remember it was like applying the brakes, you know, I mean, in, in uh, a very aggressive fashion. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and um, the uh, we took it to a trade show, by the way, or actually it was an EV um, event out in Scottsdale. Okay. The pavilions. Yes. And just to make sure we had enough to get back, um, because the Optima spiral rounds were starting to age in that T0, mm -hmm. we brought one of our utility vans, uh, one of the Gruber Technical Services vans, with a generator just in case. And we parked it right next to it. And um, But yeah, that was, that was quite a car. Uh, it also um, uh, it, um, became very uh, uh, popular because they, they, uh, they took T0 number two, I believe it was, to, um, uh, to Laguna Seca, which is a California racetrack, very popular here in the U.S., kind of like uh, Nürburgring in uh, Germany. And um, a lot of exotic cars raced on that track. And this little AC propulsion T0 was actually embarrassing Lamborghinis and Ferraris of the day and McLarens. And that's how a lot of people became acquainted and took notice of it, including Elon, of course, and yes. Martin, Ar yeah, and, uh, Martin Eberhardt. But uh, yeah, thank you for chiming in. A bit of history there from one of our viewers. Um, thank you. Thank you. Great story. TikTok, Joel1031 says, Edison is coming out with an electric truck. It's a 1990s Silverado with uh, 385,000 miles on it. I, I assume that that's what the 385,000 means. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means exactly, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, those guys are doing some really cool stuff up there in the, um, in the backwoods, uh, converting big diesel stuff to, um, uh, to EV. And uh, uh, they're, they are, they're definitely an entertaining watch on uh, YouTube. Most definitely. And up, up there in British Columbia, they've got the space to do some of that stuff. I could, I could yeah. definitely see them grabbing an, old, uh, an older style uh, Chevy Silverado pickup truck and doing the same type of electric conversion. Uh, we have a TikTok comment from Will. He says, the carbon footprint is bigger with electric. And, uh, of course, there's, there are a lot of uh, conflicting viewpoints on that. But uh... There are. Uh, I'm going to start by ta having uh, Joel 1031's response, and then I'll, I'll chime in as well. He says, everything leaves a footprint, good and bad. Um, Joel is right. Um, Will's point about electric, uh, electric cars having a bigger carbon footprint is true early in the life of the electric car. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the difference, um, and there, this, here's where the real debate is, how long do you have to drive an electric car before you lose the, you know, before you get to that tipping point where the electric car has less carbon footprint than a gas-powered car? Um, the general consensus is, is that it's probably somewhere around 100,000 miles. Um, maybe a little bit less, and that's mm -hmm. simply because there's so much more carbon that goes into the mining operations and the manufacturing operations for the batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> with the recycling of lithium-ion batteries, however, that's, going, that's really ramping up, especially redwood materials, and the fact that uh, even like we mentioned earlier today, there are people that are driving their electric cars hundreds of thousands of miles because... With fewer parts, people are finding that the electric cars simply last better and longer with less repairs. Um, I would tend to, in my overall feeling, is disagree with his assertion. I do not think electric cars in their life cycle have a bigger carbon footprint than gasoline-powered cars. And, of course, the other element there is you mentioned two of the most important ones. You drive them longer. They mm -hmm. have fewer moving parts. They're going to be on the road much longer. Um, and then, of course, the recycling efforts, which are getting closer to a zero waste stream. Right. Um, but, um, yeah, then you, uh, well, I had a thought, and I, it, it uh, just escaped me. That happens. I'm 72 <laughs> years old, guys, so occasionally I'm going to have one that just, uh, you know, disappears. Well, Pete, uh, we'll just always fall back on, hopefully, you know, we only have to have this conversation a few more years because we got aliens and fusion. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
All right, Ed Prelitz is joining us again from YouTube. Welcome, Ed. Um, he says, do you believe or hope that Tesla will release another Roadster in version two? Well, <clears throat> that's actually on the drawing boards. Yes. Um, it uh, was initially announced in 2017, I believe, or 2018 timeframe, and everybody got all excited. They had a down payment program for $50,000 down. You could reserve a uh, signature series, the first 1,000 or so. And, um, but anyway, um, uh, Tesla has been preoccupied with the creation of other vehicles, more mainstream, keeping shareholders happy, keeping the profitability up and, uh, meeting the broader demand. So the all projections at this point for this new roadster, um, were disappointingly missed, but they feel that by 2024, that is the new target date for this new roadster. The upside in all this is that uh, it continues to improve. The uh, I think the original zero to 60 was 1.9 seconds, which was just faster than any production car ever made. And as other vehicles began to um, appear on the horizon with that kind of performance, mm -hmm. like the Rimac, for example, Tesla began to, or continued to, uh, to design this version two Roadster. And uh, they're now even talking about rocket thrusters from SpaceX that are gonna put this into just over one second, zero to 60. I'm not sure I can drive that kind of a car because I don't know if I can handle the G-forces. Well, is it driving a car or is it pointing a car? <laughs> yeah, good point, yep. You just point it in the direction and it goes. Um, you know, and road and track, uh, we, we, Richard and I had mentioned on our regular Tesla podcast that's on Tuesdays and Thursdays, last week we mentioned road and track has a list of 51 uh, upcoming models that are coming out. And uh, near the end of that list was the Tesla Roadster. They were predicting 2025, um, but they, uh, I, I don't, we don't know, that's speculation. Mm -hmm. uh, the big thing that they did mention though was that uh, Elon had made uh, some more news about talking of how they do have an engineering team that's actively working on the Roadster. They're definitely developing it. He just said, I can't promise exactly when it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna come. So Jesse, if we can throw up a picture, <clears throat> it is the isolation transformer dash one picture. All right, on there. Coming up yep, now. There it is. <clears throat> what we're about to see here, this is a a view of our lab, at least a portion of it. And what's on the table there is something we just received. These are power electronic module um, isolation transformers that go into the power electronics module in a Tesla Roadster. What you're seeing there is the um, the phase driver board, or the um, yeah the phase power driver board, and um, it is a small board that has two isolation transformers on it that are highly custom. Uh, we've been trying to uh, find replacements for those for many years and have been unable because they're custom wound. Um, our procurement team <clears throat> actually finally found these. It was new out of stock. And uh, the vendor was probably grateful to finally get rid of them because they weren't going to be of any value to anyone. But for the Roadster world, it's definitely of value. If we can throw up um, isolation transformer number two, we get a little bit more of a close-up of what these look like. And um, <clears throat> this is important, very important, and let me explain why. In the Roadster world, there are design issues in the power electronics module. And <clears throat> one of them is, excuse me, <clears throat> there is an insulation material that separates a IGBT transistor from a heat sink. And that insulating material, back in 2008 when these things were assembled, uh, seemed like a reasonable um, a solution alternative. It turns out that as this stuff ages, it becomes brittle, it crumbles, and eventually the distance between the transistor case and ground shrinks dramatically where eventually it shorts. Now, when this transistor shorts, what you have is 400 volts DC, and hundreds of amps, and of course with that much current <clears throat> and that much voltage, you're going to be welding things. Mm -hmm. And when you get that much um, electrical activity, it generally goes upstream and downstream. And even though that small board sits on top of the power board, uh, it oftentimes is affected by a blown IB, um, IGBT transistor. 
And these transformers are in the path and sometimes they open or fail internally. We had one car that was here actually from Sweden. <clears throat> it was a Tesla Roadster PEM. It came without the car because, uh, you know, it's difficult to ship cars internationally. And when we rebuild PEMs for international customers, we generally just get the PEM. Mm -hmm. It turns out this one was a failed PEM. And uh, one of these transformers was bad. And it took us about nine months to finally get a solution. Um, again, Tesla came through. Even though they're not supposed to do this, uh, we ended up with a used board. And uh, we were able to put this customer's uh, roadster back on the road. I do. I remember that. Um, <clears throat> so we now have <clears throat> 500 of these transformers in stock. And this is a major benefit uh, and win for the roadster community because these, these types of um, uh, custom parts can actually uh, represent, uh, you know, the cessation of being able to drive these cars. So um, we're, we're pretty pleased with our procurement team and being able to find these parts. Yeah, shout out to uh, Logan Johnson and uh, over to Todd over there. Todd Alexander. Um, yeah. You know, th those two guys really uh, went over the top. And, you in know, their we, ability to get these. Yeah, we do this um, not only for the community and ourselves, of course, but mm -hmm. also for Tesla. Tesla comes to us often recognizing that we're able to source some of these difficult-to-find products. And uh, we've got a number of projects like this in play with Tesla. And again, people ask, well, does Tesla really care about the Tesla Roadster? And, you know, are they still supporting it? And, well, why would they come to a vendor like us to find parts like this if that wasn't the case? Well, exactly. And, uh, you know, Tesla has, to, to use the uh, colloquialism, they have bigger fish to fry. Yes. They, they've, they've got a, a new vehicle, the Cybertruck, that they're trying to put out where they've got close to 2 million reservations. They, they got to get that thing right and get it done. It helps them if we're able to go in our little corner of the universe, find some of these things, and then they already, they now know that, hey, if we have a, an unusual part, something that's, uh, you know, that we can't find anymore, let's call Gruber Motors and see if they've had the time to find it themselves before we go out and try to search the world for it. And of course, they also take advantage of not just Gruber Motors' abilities and skills, but our other divisions here, which is our machine shop, the, yes. uh, the critical power division. There were, there were often times when we actually machined parts for Tesla uh, and recreated uh, vital roadster parts. Yeah, so that's, uh, it's been a really good two-way partnership for that. Um, on YouTube, PYGKLB, greetings from Western Oregon. Welcome. Welcome. And then on Fine Power Tools Sales West is back. Uh, they said good morning from P Fine Power Tools. Hope the shop is putting the supercut to good use. Thank you for joining us, by the way. Yes, we received some of the tool attachments that were sent to us, I guess, last week or while I was on mm -hmm, vacation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the guys are beginning to use them and uh, they'll have feedback for you, which ones are working out the best. Uh, Fine Tools, by the way, just to give them um, some uh, recognition and a plug here, is a company that um, had the foresight to adapt a tool that they made for the medical industry to take casts off um, after uh, you know uh, the um, uh, uh, the bone has been healed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and of course you can't quite use a saber saw or a skill saw to do that, and uh, you know because you're very close to skin. So they made a special vibrating tool that actually cuts through the cast without injuring uh, the yeah. um, uh, the patient. Well, they um, they decided this might have broader applications, so they took a look at the EV business and the um, uh, the need to disassemble. Uh, large high voltage battery systems in uh, Tesla's to start mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. and realize that uh, this tool may work for that. So what we've been doing in conjunction with them is experimenting and testing this tool to uh, loosen the lid on top of the 1200 pound Tesla Model S and X battery packs and uh, be able to take it off much safer, faster, and a more um, you know, equitable way. Yeah, I know the guys uh, over at least some of the things that Fine has sent us. They are, they're just raving about it and how good it's been for us. So thank you guys for sending that. And uh, yeah, we'll continue to plug you on, on our podcast as well and let, let people know how much you're helping. 
So you two, alternative energy, Aotearoa. Well, you said it better. Aotearoa. Aotearoa. Okay. <laughs> Thomas Curtis, uh, Kia Ora from Aotearoa. Uh, Thomas, I think I finally, after several podcasts, mm -hmm. learned how to announce Aotearoa for you. And then YouTube, uh, Niles is here from the Bion Danish Genome Institute. Uh, in reference to footprint, he says if the choice is for a low miles per year drivers, it's between a new EV and keeping an old gas car, then the latter, the small, the, the gas car will have the smaller footprint. Niles, I think you're correct. It's, uh, uh, if, if, if you're only putting 8,000 to 10,000 miles a year on a, on a gasoline powered car, then it's going to take such a long time to get to that mileage level that it could be the case. Mm -hmm. uh, he says in Europe and in smaller countries, most people don't drive more than four to 8,000 miles a year, which explains the slower EV pickup there. Also, he says Euro cars are more economical small cars. Uh, typically, they'll be diesels with 60 to 70 miles per gallon and ranges of anywhere from six to 800 miles. That's a, that's a great point you have in Europe because here in the United States, well, to give you an example, my son lives on one end of the Phoenix metro area. My daughter lives on another end of the Phoenix metro area. We have city the whole way, and they live 75 miles apart. And that's after my son moved 25 miles closer into town from where he was. Right. They used to live 100 miles apart, and it's all metro Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, here, especially in the western United States, we have a driving culture. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife and I bought a, a Volvo XC40 recharge in November. We have 19,000 miles on that Volvo here in August. We're going to put probably 24,000 miles on it in its first year. Mm -hmm. You know, my father came here about 30 years ago or so from Bavaria, and uh, parking is a real problem there, and car ownership is nowhere near per capita what it is here in the U.S., most people there still ride bicycles, actually. Right. You know, it's a much more uh, healthy way to um, uh, to move around. And the proximity of, uh, you know, one store to another is very close. They can auction, they can actually uh, do their shopping by walking into the town square often. You got your baker, your butcher, and all of that. Right. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just fascinating. So he was here, and he said, I can't believe you guys drive 35 miles to go to a store. You know, yeah. <laughs> over there, it's another country. You know, in his yeah. case, because he lives in southern Bavaria, <laughs> and that'd be Austria. Yeah. Yesterday, I drove to South Chandler. I do, I do it once every three weeks for my haircut. It's 46 miles one way. Oh, my God. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And he's paying $30 for a haircut. See, I haven't gotten a haircut in 20 years. I, I was shocked when I heard that. <laughs> I'm so glad that I have this uh, this look and this, uh, uh, this style. Yeah, haircuts are not cheap. Uh, user 604 on TikTok uh, asks us, do you think you could get Elon on this podcast? He's been on so many other podcasts that aren't even EV related. You know, I have been um, emailing him on and off for the last few years to do that very thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just assume that he's busy. I know the email's good. Um, but yeah, one of these days uh, he's going to come here. And the reason I think he's going to come here is... Um, we are early days of Tesla. If anybody um, uh, wants to indulge in nostalgia, and a lot of Tesla people do, either ex-Tesla or current Tesla, they come here, they go into a shop, and they see 50 Tesla Roadsters, and they go, my God, this is like Menlo Park. This is like San Carlos back right. in the day, you know, right. when there was nothing but Roadsters. So I think it would be a great nostalgia trip for Elon, and uh, my invitation generally goes something like this. Elon, you've got a private plane. We've got an airport within walking distance of our service center. Fly into Deer Valley, spend a morning with us, come on our podcast, and enjoy your early generation cars. I think that'd be a great thing to do. You know, we're going to have to reach out to him or his assistant again uh, when those Chinese roadsters come in. Yeah, yeah. actually, that's the end of this month. And uh, I, I think he's on the list as well. We're going to be inviting some uh, media people. Good. But, uh, you know, yesterday... Um, Elon actually did show up for the podcast. That's right. Yeah. And of course, you have to remember that Elon has become like Santa Claus. He can't do it all himself, so there are a lot of helpers. 
And we see that on social media, do we not? I mean, how many Elons do we have in our, in our There's Facebook? There's a few of them out there. I actually had to ban an Elon this morning. <laughs> oh, I'm doing it all the time yeah, because he, new ones pop up every day. Well, yeah, he was trying to sell Bitcoin and was writing poems <laughs> on our on our last post in the Tesla Roadster uh, Facebook page, yeah. Well, and Elon wanted to borrow uh, money from you to, yeah. uh, yeah. to help start a bank. Yeah, it was um, uh, during the banking crisis in California a few months ago, and Elon contacted me and he said, look, there's an opportunity to buy the Silicon Valley Bank, and uh, let's go in it together, and then we can share the profits. And, oh, by the way, I'm going to need $20,000 to do that. Right. So I said, Elon, you just spent $44 billion on TikTok. Are you really short right now? Are you, you, know, are you short on money? He says, yeah. He says, actually, I need 100000 So the price went up, yes. which, which, of course, was supposed to make it sound a little bit more plausible. Uh, yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> All right. So TikTok, Jacob Doyden, howdy. Well, welcome. Welcome. Um, so I have something else for you guys. Um, this is a, a gift that was sent to us from Switzerland. And I'll let Mark hold it up here. Uh, this is a uh, Lego clone Tesla Roadster, which they do not make yet. But the reason I wanted to read you this letter, for a couple of reasons, we get a lot of gifts from our viewers and from our customers, and it's usually gratitude for what we do. You know, um, most of our Gruber Motor Company activity is for profit, but right. there's a whole bunch that is not. Like this podcast, for example, you know, we're right. not getting paid from YouTube to do this to anywhere near the expense that is involved in this. So oftentimes customers recognize that and they give us a special thanks, either in the form of gifts or, a, um, or some form of recognition, like mm -hmm. on Facebook yesterday. But this customer um, wrote us a note and sent this gift. He says, Dear Pete, many thanks for your continuous um, kind, um, a kind effort to keep the fantastic cars alive and your great support for the Roadster community. As much as I am a lucky owner myself, I'm also a, a, a vivid uh, Lego fan. So what lies closer to that than to create my own set of a Lego Roadster? Since Lego has not come up with one, and that's what he created. Mm -hmm. For those of you interested, his website, and I think you can buy this, is iconbricks.ch. So triple W i-c-o-n-b-r-i-c-k-s dot c-h and he says i wish you um uh, that you have a lot of fun with it so any of you interested uh that uh, would like to get a lego roadster it comes with a, a detailed instruction book on how to put it together and i'm going to turn this over to one of my sons because he loves putting legos together and um the um uh, the gentleman's name is thomas uh Roosh. R-U-E-E-S-H, uh, in Switzerland, owns Tesla Roadster VIN 350, by the way. I guess we can say that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. And, uh, you know, um, again, we're, we're very grateful to the entire community for the support that we get. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, and I have a feeling that once this is put together, this will become a, a, a more of a fixture up, uh, up on our podcast and uh, there's even a chance that we'll try to work with him to see if we can get this put as merchandise onto the uh, Gruber Motor Company show to go along with the sunglass cases and some of the other things we're looking at. We'll put it on our Easter. By the way, Ed Prelitz, who asked earlier about the Tesla Roadster number two, version two, I keep forgetting we have one right there by the TikTok camera. And um, it was actually signed by Franz von Holzhausen, who is the lead designer or leads the team there at Tesla for the auto design. Yeah, now anyone who's not on Instagram probably can't see yeah, that that's car the Instagram right now. One, yep. um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take at some point and I'll, I'll reach forward or Peter reach forward and we'll, we'll pull that car out so everyone can see it. All right. Um, YouTube, uh, Niles is back with us again I, I, and he wants to give us an important clarification. Uh, while Niles said, you know, hey, for the driving that we do, uh, diesel powered or fossil fuel powered cars probably have a lower carbon footprint right now. He says, I am for the EV transition. Of course, I will be getting an Aptera. That's going to be a cool car, Niles. Um, I'm very impressed with that car. There was one at the uh, Tesla Roadster uh, or no, the Tesla uh, event out in uh, California this weekend. 
Oh, okay. The roundup, they called Tesla it. Tesla takeover. Uh, Tesla takeover. There you go. And uh, yeah, I mean, compared to the other sedans that you saw out there, this Aptera looked very futuristic. It looked like uh, something out of the Jetsons uh, movie or... Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, the current version is movie, but I used to yeah. watch it as a series yeah, on, me too. on uh, television. Me too. The, yeah. These guys over here are probably all too yeah. young, but... Um, of course, the solar top on that car and the styling, um, the, um, uh, the in-wheel motors, it's uh, pretty state-of-the-art stuff. I think we have one customer in California that has one, and uh, he's very happy with it, by the way. Yes, and then uh, Niles has a follow-up for us as well. He says, right uh, right now, he says, I bicycle around for shopping in Errol. Uh, last year, I filled up three to four times. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, man, that's like once every th uh, three to four months, he's filling up with fuel. He says, that's efficiency. I'm jealous, mm -hmm. you know, but for two reasons. First, he's only filling up on, with fuel three to four times. Second, he lives in a place where he can bicycle. I love cycling. Mm-hmm. And here in Arizona, you know, we just got off of 31 days uh, of 110 plus. We're uh, we're into our next our, our our next try to beat the 31 days already, and uh, that means it's not good cycling weather. No, I was no. about to say just that, Mark. Here it's a little little bit different. You know, cycling would be wonderful at a, I'd say maybe from October to late March, but then the rest of the year, it becomes hazardous to one's health. Yeah. Yeah, right now, uh, between 4.30 in the morning and 7 o'clock, that's about the only time you can cycle. Well, you used to ride a, uh, a, a sports bike. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I had my Ninja 600, um, I made the mistake of going out in this type of weather on that bike with, um, with a tank top, mind you, all right? So mm -hmm. I had exposed skin. And I had no idea that that kind of heat would actually wick the moisture right out of your body, mm -hmm. just like a, a sponge, you know? Oh, yeah. And, 100%. Uh, when, yeah. I, uh, when I used to work up at Vanguard, it's the, that office is off the rain, a rain tree in the 101, so it's a good 20 minutes north. Mm -hmm. um, I would, during the summer, and I rode year-round, so if it was 120 out, whatever, you know, I'd ride. Um, I used to get my, and I'd have a suit and tie and like the whole deal on, right? I would put my white undershirt on uh, after drenching it in water. Mm -hmm. I'd throw that on, throw my dress clothes on, it'd look all all wet and whatnot, and then I'd hop on my bike right up there. By the time I got up there, completely dry. Yeah, amazing. But huh? it was great. <laughs> uh, YouTube, Alternative Energy, Atia Roa. Uh, it says, congratulations, and a smiley face, peace sign. Oh, well, thank you. And so, and then uh, Fine Power Tools Sales says, glad to help. All right, I've got an image we can pop up. Uh, Jesse, if you can put up custom colors. This was actually a picture uh, that uh, Mike Aldea posted on one of the Facebook sites. And uh, Michael is one of the early Tesla battery technicians uh, when there was nothing but Roadster. But um, he had the foresight to get some cool pictures back then. And what we're looking at here is three Tesla Roadsters, and uh, they call these the 1.5 Holy Grail, uh, or the Holy Trinity of 1.5s. These are 1.5 Roadsters, each one of them. And I'll go through each one of them. Um, the one in the back is actually a custom copper color, VIN number five, one, uh, 500. It was the last 1.5 Roadster made before they switched over to the 2.0 Roadsters, which is a slightly different body style. Um, that particular car was sold on our matchmaking site about a year and a half or so ago, and it took almost six months or more for it to sell. And it wasn't because the price was wrong or, you know, there was no collector interest. Uh, normally a collector would have jumped all over this because sure. it's rare. It's a pedigree car. It's a custom color. It's the last of series. The problem was we learned the stigma and power of salvage title. And this car got really unfairly uh, stuck with that stigma. Um, the owner, Eric, was driving down a road in uh, California freeway, and a landscaper uh, trailer in front of him dropped a small pipe, and it was bouncing in the road, and he couldn't avoid it. And uh, once he ran over it, it apparently propped up a bit, and it punctured the driver's side floor pan. And the hole was probably the size of a baseball or a softball, somewhere in there. 
Um, he thought it'd be an easy fix, so he took it to the body shop, actually Tesla at the time, and um, someone deemed that, uh, that the repair was going to require a frame change on the car. Oh, my gosh. Instead of just simply taking an aluminum plate and pop riveting that on there and calling it a day, right? Right, right. Well, insurance companies, uh, you know, operate in strange ways at times. So this car actually did get totaled and the owner had the foresight to buy it back. Okay. And then do exactly what I just proposed. Go get a piece of aluminum, 14, 16 gauge or whatever, some pop rivets, flatten it out and you and put the carpet back on it and no one you know knows yeah, the difference yeah, then you're good to go um so again we we learned the uh, stigma of a salvage title and that's why this car took so long to sell it is a one of color a copper color and again vin 500 the one to the right is a insane green and uh, there's only one of this color that was uh, sprayed here in the United States. There are more in Europe, I think five or so. The other thing that makes this car so unique is it's VIN number 100, which means it's the last of the signature 100 cars. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, Mark's, um, uh, he did some research and he's got a bit more to the story on this car. I did. I, uh, you know, we were... As we as we do our show prep, we were talking about the story on this car, and I saw that there was an article on Medium.com about Daimler and Tesla. And then I, uh, so I went first and found that article, and then I managed to pull up that image of Elon Musk and uh, and somebody from Daimler sitting in a in in, in this Roadster. Yeah, let's 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 uh, bring up the image, Jesse. Um, the name of the image is Daimler Dash Tesla zero eight twelve eighty. Yeah, from there I was able to find an article back in 2009 from Wired and a couple of other articles that were dated similarly in the, in the 2010s. So this is that same car, the day that, uh, and the significance of this picture is because this is the day that Daimler formally put about a 9% investment into Tesla. Um, it was a mutually beneficial relationship that lasted almost seven years. Uh, I think Daimler got out just before Tesla stock sky skyrocketed, unfortunately for them. Right. Um, and uh, the reason it was mutually beneficial for Daimler, uh, this effort in partnership with Tesla kicked off the Mercedes electric vehicle engineering uh, process. Efforts, yeah. Uh, yeah, all, all of their efforts really stem back to this partnership. For Tesla, uh, they were having trouble working with vendors, being taken seriously in the automotive industry, even though at this point they had already put out the Tesla Roadster. And Daimler's investment in Tesla told the entire automotive world that this is a real company and there's a real, true, um, important, steadfast automaker that's willing to put money into this company, so Tesla must be legitimate. Right. So it greatly legitimized Tesla in their ability to work with vendors. Also, the Daimler and Mercedes-Benz engineers worked with the Tesla engineers as they were getting ready to develop the Model S and gave them uh, invaluable insight, coaching, and uh, technical expertise to build out the production line for the Model S. Sure. Now, what you're seeing here <clears throat> is a VIN number 100 in Germany. It was actually in the U.S. It was uh, built here, sprayed here, all of that. Mm -hmm. The car came to us about uh, three, four years ago, so it was uh, bricked, and uh, we recovered the battery pack on it. Um, so the uh, current owner, um, uh, he actually corroborated the story that you just said. He said, yeah, this car was in Germany at one point, and yeah. it was used as the, as the uh, poster boy for uh, Daimler to convince them to invest in Tesla. Yes. Now, if you look at this picture, you'll see Elon is towering over the two Germans there in the middle. And uh, those are the Daimler execs, but there's also a smart car, e-version smart car. Mm -hmm. And that was originally what triggered the interest by Daimler in Tesla. Um, long story short, <clears throat> at one point, Elon decided, you know what, this small e or this, uh, this uh, smart car would be an easy car to electrify. You know, they've got a three cylinder engine in them, right, and right. tiny and all that. But they weren't selling them in the United States yet. They hadn't uh, met, uh, you know, the approvals. So he sent a technician with a fistful of money down to Mexico City to buy a smart car. He drove it all the way across the border, brought it up to, um, uh, to Tesla, 
and they ended up um, electrifying it just like they did the Tesla Roadster. And because this car is so small and light, <clears throat> it was actually popping wheelies. So somehow they managed to, um, uh, to get a hold of uh, Daimler and they found out that some engineers were going to be here in the United States at a trade show. And they got, or they got them to commit to come to see them at the factory. They mm -hmm. hadn't told them yet about this e-car that they had converted or the smart car that got converted to uh, EV. So the, so the guys showed up, they, they were done with their trade show. And you know, like most uh, uh, um, you know, engineers that travel, uh, it's, it's a rest and recuperation type thing. And they were hung over from the night before, but they were sitting in this, uh, in this conference room. And, uh, so Tesla was going over a PowerPoint presentation, uh, trying to intrigue them with, uh, the electrification of a car. Right. Mm -hmm. And they found that they were falling asleep at their desks. So at one point, uh, this is the way legend has it anyway, Elon said, okay, enough PowerPoint. We want to show you something out in our warehouse. So he takes the engineers out to the warehouse, shows them the smart car. They didn't realize it had been electrified, gave them the keys and let them drive up and down the back of the building, their popping wheelies. And we think that that was what the original um, uh, motivation was, because by the time these guys got back to Germany and talked about their escapades, uh, people became interested. And then uh, we think that VIN 100, the insane green, was then shipped over to Daimler to show them the car and prove that this is a viable concept. Sure. You know, and I, I, I just, I can, I can picture in my mind's eye um, a smart car. I mean, it's smaller and lighter than a Roadster by a lot. It's, it's got that short front to back right. uh, length because they're, what, nine feet long or something like that. And, um, and replacing a three-cylinder, 65-horsepower motor or something of that sort with a even lighter electric motor that puts out 240 horse. Um, oh, man, that had to be a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they couldn't keep those front wheels down. So that's a story on VIN 100, which is insane green. Now, a couple of other people piped up here. And it turns out that uh, Tom Greiner said that VIN 100 was actually a slightly different color from the actual later insane green Euro Roadster. Remember, they're about five or so in uh, Europe. They yes. were this color. Uh, by the way, when I was test driving this car, we do that after every uh, you right. know, battery recovery. Right. Uh, I drive Roadsters every week, different ones. This one got the most attention. No doubt about it. You know, in parking lots, in car, uh, and um, oh, on I, the road. Oh, I could totally you know, see that. I even took this to a Lamborghini dealer and I parked out front because I wanted to take pictures of this next to some Lamborghinis mm -hmm. and it cleared out the sales floor. All the salespeople came out to look <laughs> at this car. So it's definitely a popular color here in the U.S. But anyway, so Tom says that this was a prototype paint and they changed the formula a bit later on um, for the uh, Euro Roadsters. They also um, apparently held back uh, the production on this uh, VIN 100 car because it was made later in production. And uh, we'd have to ask Tom why that was the case or whether they were planning on parading this around being uh, the last of the signature cars. And um, then someone else piped up, uh, Eric Robertson actually in uh, Texas. He says, yep, the green on 100 is greener. Now he would know because I think he wrapped one of his roadsters in this insane green. Oh, okay. okay. He was probably doing research trying to figure out what color do I really want here? You yeah. Know? Uh, he said it was greener than other insane green roadsters I've seen. He says on the Lotus color palette, it was a development version of what became Krypton green, which is more yellow. And he said Lotus owners described it as radioactive sludge. So there's an interesting story there about uh, that particular color. And then finally, the one on the left of that uh, image, let's go back to um, custom colors. Um, and uh, as someone pointed out, it goes without saying, that is Martin Eberhardt's founder's number two roadster. Um, there was one that sold on our matchmaking site that was the exact opposite of this color. It was very orange with gray stripes. Okay. And uh, Martin knew the people that, uh, um, uh, that originally bought the car or um, uh, that requested that color. So there you have it. That is the uh, early 1.5 color variation 
um, in the first 500 Tesla Roadsters built. I can definitely attest to the yellow being um, a, an attention-grabbing car. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, a, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to you, if you remember, just before you went on vacation, I said, I saw something driving down by my house and I couldn't catch up to it to find out what it was. Um, while you were on vacation, I came across that car again. Really? Okay. It's an Audi e-tron. They have a sports car and it is that color exactly. Very cool. And okay. so I, we were driving, my wife and I were driving through the parking lot of a little restaurant that we like to go to on Saturday mornings for breakfast. And that car was just in front of us driving uh, through the parking lot as well. So I didn't have a chance to get a picture of it, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but now that I know that these are people that live in the Chandler area, it's, it, if I can, I'm, I'm hoping to be able to see it again. Uh, and I hope that Tesla will eventually put some bold colors into their car lineup like this. Oh, you and me both. To yeah. get some more attention to their cars because people love these kinds of colors. The ra the, the really bright reds, the, the this insane green that looks almost like a neon yellow, uh, the, the oranges, you just don't see those on cars anymore. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Even the um uh, the Roadster Electric Blue, which is a beautiful metallic blue. Oh yeah. It looks like Michael just piped up. Yeah, he's on YouTube. Michael Aldea is the um he's actually the one that posted these uh pictures of the Roadster. He says, Hi, it's missing founder one. Yes, it is. Yep. We've got founder two there and Elon's got founder number one. You know, PYGKLB on YouTube has given us another comment too. Uh, this one's more for Richard than anyone else, I think. We were talking about riding motorcycles. I, he says, I once rode through Nevada on my motorcycle. We'd stop at rest areas, pour water on our T-shirts under our arrow stitch, and then within 10 miles, it'd be completely dry. Yeah, that definitely tracks, yeah. Yeah, that, that's... that's I, I When I was first out of college, I drove a uh, motorcycle, commuted to and from work from my home in western Phoenix over to Scottsdale. So it was about a 35-minute drive, and then I made the mistake one day of having my big, heavy, full-face mask helmet on, and it was 112 that day. I almost passed out on Lincoln Drive because I was getting yeah. so overheated. I had to lift my visor yeah. and uh, in order to not just pass out from the heat. Oh, man, having those full-face helmets was miserable yeah. during the summer. But, you know, I mean, I've gone down nine times. And mm -hmm. after the first one, which yeah. I didn't have a helmet. You, uh, you want to keep your face. I do want to keep my face. Uh, I also <laughs> want to keep what remains of the brain cells yeah. right. that are present. Because my first accident, I wasn't wearing a helmet. And I low side and I smacked my head on the ground. I got up and I was so dizzy and walking, falling over the place. People thought I was drunk. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It was uh, immediate concussion. And after that, I never rode without a helmet. And thank God it saved my life more than once. But it was miserable during the summer. Yep, can only imagine. Um, Niles has uh, uh, another comment for us about the bicycling, and he says there are cycle paths with traffic signals and painted lanes and directions. Mm -hmm. Bicycle traffic jams too in the rush hour. <laughs> Maybe the U.S. has made more cycle paths by now, don't know. I know that Phoenix is working at it. You know, they try. The problem, though, is, is you've got a wonderful bicycle path, and then it ends up going into nothingness, and you've got to ride in the dirt again. Yeah. They just don't anticipate, or they haven't uh, completed the project. Maybe let's put it that way. Well, they'll, they'll have a bicycle path. Uh, first, I don't like that they'll have a three-foot-wide or four-foot-wide bicycle path going next to a, 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 a two-lane road, uh, in each direction. So a four lane yeah. road and it's a 50 mile an hour road. Mm -hmm. So that speed variation is a problem. And then that path will, uh, sometimes the, uh, the city will do dotted lines because, uh, traffic needs to turn right. Mm -hmm. So they'll dot, they'll have the dotted line for the bicycle path go to the left, which means you're actively crossing the path of the cars. Yeah. It's not a good design. It's dangerous, no, no. They just need to allow bicyclists on the sidewalk. I, I still don't understand why that's not allowed. Yeah. Nobody walks on the sidewalk in Phoenix. Right. Yeah, they burn their feet. So we've got a, um, a, a section about the uh, MG Cyberster. And the reason we threw that in is because Tesla doesn't have the next generation Roadster yet. Right. And uh, we've all been waiting for, is somebody going to scoop that? And it looks like MG is going to do that because if you think about it, 
how many electric sports cars are there out there except for the legacy Tesla Roadster, mm -hmm. as in none at this point. So this is an interesting car. Do we have a picture of that? No, I guess we don't. If you go to last, uh, last week's, um, seven, I think it's what, the 27th, we have a couple of pictures in the images file of the MG Cyberster in last week, from last week's podcast. But you know what impressed me most about this, Mark, was um, this thing there is going to be go. selling. Yeah, yeah. This is going to be selling in China for 33350 U.S. dollars. Uh, again, I'm asking, how, how can they do that? Of course, you ask that a lot with Chinese product. You know? Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, how can you buy that uh, you know, $5 item from China, have it shipped over here, stored in an Amazon warehouse, have a guy, a union driver, drive it out to your house and deliver it for five bucks? You know? <laughs> I know, I know. You know, it's, I, I mentioned, we, Richard and I were talking about this a little bit last week, and that, and that, 30, that 33,000, you know, they've got three trim levels, Pete. Oh, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, the, the low trim level is a single motor, 302 horsepower, 64 kilowatt hour battery. Right. The mid trim level is a 348 horsepower motor and a 77 kilowatt hour battery. It's only $2,000 more. Wow. The top level trim combines the two motors. So it's an all wheel drive with about 570 horse. Right. Uh, a, a sub three second, zero to 60 time in the 77 kilowatt hour battery for another $2,000. Amazing. So that yep. 33.5 only goes up to 37,500 for a car that's probably faster and has better range than a Roadster, Tesla right. Roadster. Um, who do we know in China? who can get us one of these cars. <laughs> <laughs> I think Khaled might have a couple connections. Yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> we should have had one shipped over with those three Roadsters, but. Oh, man, um, they're amazing cars, looks well, like. They're gonna be selling them uh, at, starting in 2024 in the UK and uh, China this year, it says. Yes. So um, and that's yeah. that's news because we had, we were talking about uh, 2024 for everything. Now it sounds like it's going to be even more faster in China. Yeah, they even talk about a yoke steering wheel uh, that may frustrate some people and uh, please others. But um, again, it's just um, it's it's amazing to watch this EV evolution occurring, and uh, we we've all been waiting for is somebody else going to come along and uh, uh, you know be first with a second generation roadster. Yeah, it looks like MG has done exactly that. Uh, one of the questions that I have is, uh, since they're going in China and the UK, does that mean that they have left-hand drive and right-hand drive versions of this car? Good point, yeah. I, I'm gonna guess that they probably do. Um, and second question, of course, to me is, um, Maybe if we can't get one from China, we can get one from England, even though it's seventy thousand dollars there <laughs> in the UK. Yeah, prepare yourself for customs and shipping and all that. Uh, we we keep going through that from time to time and uh, realize how expensive that is. That'll raise the price of the vehicle. But again, China's pretty impressive. The company that is going to be uh, producing this is the SAIC Group, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it uh, eventually hitting the U.S. here. Yes. Uh, YouTube, Ed Prelitz has a question for us. Um, are there any thoughts that you have on the Thacker Pass lithium mine and its importance globally compared to other countries' mining operations on the production of EV vehicles? Well, my personal thought is um, the, the uh, battery technology continues to evolve rapidly. And uh, I think it's pretty risky, um, you know, building out uh, some more lithium mining at this point, considering all of the technologies that look so much more promising. There is going to be some risk to it. You know, this is the, obviously the big Nevada mine that they're talking about. Um, our, our, if the political environment changes in the United States, where the federal government doesn't require battery and raw materials for batteries to be uh, sourced in the U.S., then this Thacker Pass lithium mine isn't going to be that important from a global standpoint. Right. But as long as the climate that we have right now stays, 
this mine is going to allow a lot of uh, battery EV manufacturers in the short term mm -hmm. to put together vehicles that will qualify for the federal credits. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's where the political will is. Um, and I think this mine is going to have a, a huge impact on decoupling the United States from China because this is one of the largest known lithium reserves in the world. And of course, the distance uh, to the customer has been uh, reduced dramatically instead of mining in Bolivia, for example. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and the distance to further refinement and manufacturing because this is not that far from uh, the Nevada Gigafactory. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, I have an item here, and um, it has to do with a uh, question that was actually asked on the Bring a Trailer site, which is an auction site that, um, uh, that auctions off cars. And um, the uh, comment that was made on Bring a Trailer was, and let me bring it up here. God, I didn't realize we had so many items here. Um, there we go. Um, there's another Roadster for sale on the Bring a Trailer site. And uh, it's uh, one of our competitors. You know, the matchmaking site uh, is free. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, there's no expiration date. Uh, it's uh, very friendly because the buyer can talk to the seller directly, mm -hmm. and uh, we're not involved in the financial uh, negotiation. We we're we're a dating service. We unite buyer and seller. Right, right. Um, and of course, we provide a lot of additional services like uh, you know escrow assistance and uh, transport selection and uh, quite a bit of uh, value add there. Um, but the question was asked here for as rare as these cars seem to be. They're coming on a weekly basis to bring a trailer. Um, he makes a good point. Um, the, um, there's, there's a lot of roadster movement right now. There are a lot of sales occurring, and a lot of people are beginning to uh, either think about selling them or selling them. And I've compiled a list of the reasons that we've seen in the, um, hang on a second here, see if I can find this. There we go. Um, some of the top selling reasons that we hear through the matchmaking site when someone mm -hmm. comes to us. Um, it's usually, uh, it could be age-related illnesses, back problems, surgeries. <clears throat> I remember uh, the Roadster is not an easy car to get in and out of, and uh, they call it the Roadster Wiggle. At some point in time, you may not be able to do the Roadster Wiggle anymore. Sure. Every morning I get out of the roadsters, I brace myself on the steering wheel, I grab the, um, um, uh, the door sill, and you kind of have to uh, have some you know, upper body strength and uh, definitely have a sound back in order to do that. So that's one of the reasons for selling it. We've had customers that said, look, I'm in my 70s now, I can't do this anymore. I love the car, but uh, uh, it's just not a, uh, uh, the type of car that I can continue to drive. Some people end up moving out of the country they don't want to take the car with them. Um, others are troubled by the availability of Tesla service center options. Now, we've made a list, and Jesse, if you could pop that up, it's uh, called service centers. And for those of you interested in where can you take your roadster these days, this is a list that is being um, developed by the community. We're asking people, let us know what success you've had, mm -hmm. where it's been, and uh, we will post it so you can see which service centers are um, accepting Tesla Roadsters. And at the same time, we've reached out to Tesla, and they're not yet prepared to give us a list of service centers because it's still evolving, and mm -hmm. they're still training, and uh, there may be new ones even, and some other consolidations. But once that becomes available, we'll post that as well. This, this particular list that we have up here is actually on a Facebook site called Tesla Roadster Owners Group. And there are a couple of uh, Roadster owner websites. One is the 2008-2012 Roadster Owners Club, and then there's a Tesla Roadster Owners Group. This particular list is on a Tesla Roadster Owners Group. For any of you that want to see that, you can either join that or uh, just review it. Um, so... That's another reason is the amount of service options available. And of course, we'll always be there. And uh, then there's one up in Seattle that's available. And those are the two main ones as far as Tesla service in the United States, at least. Um, then there's the issue of rising cost of transport. We have customers that used to be able to drive 15 miles to their local Tesla service center, get their roads are fixed. 
Now they've got to cart the uh, car 200 some odd miles to the next service center. Right. Or to a shop like ours, which may be cross country. And um, there is a, um, a rising cost of car transport. Uh, we used to be able to get cars picked up and delivered to California for around four to five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Now it's almost double that. And it all started with COVID, actually. Um, a lot of these drivers didn't want to continue to drive. They were getting federal subsidies. And, uh, you know, um, so anyway, there's a rising cost of transport. Um, the um, uh, one other reason is roasters are aging. Deferred maintenance is beginning to uh, uh, to manifest itself. Um, we, of course, have been a proponent for that for some time. There are certain things in a Tesla Roadster that you need to pay attention to. That is deferred maintenance. Your power electronics module is going to need to be rebuilt, especially now <clears throat> that some of these are out there for 15 years and you have components in there that have an eight-year shelf life, you right. know, not even operation life. Um, <clears throat> so the deferred maintenance sometimes is motivating people to sell. And then the final one is estate sales. You know, some of the owners uh, have passed and uh, the family now is selling the cars. Um, So those are some of the fundamental reasons. And uh, any of you interested in that list of service centers, again, that that Facebook site will give you uh, some indication where those are, and that will continue to grow and uh, evolve as we get information from Tesla eventually and as the Tesla Roadster owners give us feedback. You know, a couple comments I have on this one. First, it's outside of what we see from the uh, Bring a Trailer auction site and from our our matchmaking service. Uh, Very, very little activity on Roadsters anywhere. If uh, uh, we had a person who is now using our service, they had tried to put their car on eBay Motors, for example. It was such an unusual car to sit on there that it didn't go to the right market. Right. And so they they had a much lower asking price on there than, um, than it, it, they had an asking price that was low enough that had it been on our site, we would have had people fighting over it. Sure. And, and yet was, they couldn't sell it. Yeah. And this was a roaster that had collectible elements that people didn't recognize. Yeah. Again, the car needs to be properly represented. And, uh, you know, it requires some expertise to do that. By all means. And, uh, and as more roadsters go to more collectors, you end up with fewer roadsters driving on the road. And you end up, when you have fewer roadsters driving on the road, it just kind of feeds on itself. Right. And pretty soon you have a fairly, and I think we're already here, you have a fairly large contingent of roadster owners that have their roadsters and maybe they have one as a daily driver and they have enough wealth to have a second or even a third that they're just holding in reserve to to collect. Sure. Most of these people won't really care about the distance. Right. They they don't have a problem with sending something 250 miles to a service center or even 2,500 miles across country to us. Um, that leaves the people who are using the Roadster as an older daily driver kind of in the lurch because they don't really realize that, yeah, okay, I paid a lot of money for this car 15 years ago. It's probably not worth a lot of money now. They don't even realize that that car is probably worth as much as it was when they bought it. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, one of the um, uh, the cool aspects of our matchmaking service is um, we have a pre-qualified Roadster buyer list that has been accumulated for over two years. And it's actually over 400 at this point. Mm-hmm. And our commitment to, um, to the Roadster uh, sellers is that uh, everything is free. First of all, we'll do the listing. We let you take the pictures. Um, we recommend that you get a professional photographer if you really want to present it in its best light, unless you have those skills. But once it comes to us, what we do is we create the listing, and then we send it to this list of 400 pre-qualified buyers. And oftentimes we find that the car sells just by us sending to that list before it even gets to social media, which is typically what we do 24 hours later to give right. the pre-qualified list an early warning what's available. Yeah, I, 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 I don't even remember how many times, because uh, I, I get copied as, as when those come out as an internal employee, um, it goes out to the list and six hours later or the next morning, you're saying, yeah, you know what? We've got three different 
offers on this car already. We're not even going to post it. And that's mm -hmm. happened so many times. Right. Okay. So we've got some questions there. Niles is saying, um, regarding motorcycles, he says, I was saved by a Hellite air jacket. Expensive, but in the wheelchair, it will seem cheap. Highly recommended. I'm not familiar with that. Hellite, is that a... Yeah, uh, have, are you familiar with that, Richard? I am not. I did a brief uh, stint of research on it. Um, they look a little expensive. I think they might be the ones that have the actual airbags that deploy. Yeah, it's like a jacket that deploys as soon as you, oh, okay. as, as soon as your orientation turns a certain level, it'll pop the airbags. How cool is that? You look like the Michelin man after an accident <laughs> bouncing down the road, right? <laughs> hey, if it helps, keeps us safe. I tell you what. Oh yeah. Right. Uh, and on TikTok, uh, Sarah Trush says, hello today meeting about electric cars. Uh, yes, we are, Sergei. A uh, hello from Ukraine. Uh, welcome, and I'm glad that you were able to join us today. And speaking of Ukraine, we just received a Tesla Roadster from Ukraine. It was a uh, brilliant yellow, and uh, it's going to need a lot of TLC. But uh, it's not often that we get a, a a car from an from an international source like that. Uh, there's an interesting story behind this car, including some theft involved at one point in time, and. Uh, yeah. But it's back in the U.S. now. It's currently at our shop, and uh, we're going to put this thing back on the road. I'm lo looking forward to seeing that process go. Uh, Highlander Apparel on YouTube is checking in again. Uh, it says, hi, guys. I'm just checking in. Uh, and P.S., uh, kindness is still free. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So one other item I have here actually came up on uh, one of the Roadster sites um, on Facebook, uh, the Roadster Owners Group. And uh, this is from Neil Wise, who has a uh, Tessa Roadster service repair operation. Oh, do you need to fix that? Go ahead. Looks like uh, one of our streaming services has gone down for a moment here. Is it TikTok or Instagram? Instagram. Okay. We're back up. Welcome back, Instagram. Sorry about that. Uh, Neil Wise uh, owns a, a, um, a Roadster repair service in the UK, Wise EV Limited. And um, he has mentioned this to me before, but uh, can we throw up some pictures, guys? We want to look at condenser dash one first. In the Tessa Roadster, in the front, you have these, um, these louvers and uh, a lot of space in between them. And below that, you have your, um, you've got the air conditioning condenser and a couple of spall fans, and you've got an HVAC controller. Um, but the problem is it's not out of the elements. So this is what the condenser looked like in a Tessa Roadster that Neil was repairing. And you can see there's actually chunks of aluminum uh, missing in the upper portion there. And the reason for that is this thing sits almost horizontal in the Tessa Roadster. And in wet environments, this thing is usually soaked. And worse yet, you get leaves that fall down in there. Mm -hmm. They hold the moisture. They become acidic at times as they decompose. And aluminum, uh, you know, doesn't like that kind of environment. So in the UK, he's seeing a lot of these types of repairs that are necessary, especially with the aging roadsters. He said this particular one had not only failed, but the retaining bolts had seized to the spire clips, which hold the unit in place. We've seen that too. The rust gets so bad that it fuses with the, uh, uh, with the Tinnerman clips. So he says, after giving a bit of fight, we swapped out the failed and crumbling old unit and fitted a brand new one. Luckily, they have the genuine Eberspacher units in stock, and uh, they were able to repair this. We also, by the way, have, and this was one of the uh, great benefits of being able to revive a Tessa Roadster part, we were able to uh, find these original um, condenser assemblies and furthermore, with these spall fans. So we have the entire assembly available. Here in the U.S., we see a lot less failures with this because we don't have that kind of wet climate in all parts of the U.S. at least. Right. We're going to have another, <laughs> uh, another break here for Instagram. Uh, looks like Instagram is uh, misbehaving just a little bit here. So that, that condenser unit is a mess. That is just kind of insane how bad that thing looks. As soon as we get Jesse back to his desk here after getting Instagram back up and running, I've got two other images I can show you how much uh, devastation 
uh, results in wet climates. And of course, the uh, the counter argument here is don't leave your roadster outside. It's not waterproof. Yeah, we, we say that all the time. Um, even in the United States here, uh, the charge port door, for example, is not waterproof. It will fill with water, eventually corrode a connector on a circuit board that's no longer in production. And uh, of course, to recreate a board like that for the quantities we would need would make that just cost prohibitive. Yeah, we, I've, I've seen live and in pictures of uh, the wires on those circuit boards that are just corroded completely off. Yeah, There's nothing left of them. So find a garage for your roadster, keep it under cover, keep it out of the uh, continuous wet uh, type environment. And uh, the next image would be condenser two, Jesse. Let's see if we can get the, yeah, there's the, um, what uh, is underneath the, um, uh, the condenser stack that you saw there. And you can see how much rust and corrosion looks like is right on there. about there. I uh, get my hands getting cut off right about up there though, is where one of those rusted bolts might, uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of rust up there. And then condenser number two, uh, you've got three up right now, Jesse. Condenser number two shows the assembly uh, in the car without the fans removed or that uh, compromised condenser assembly removed. And you can see how much water damage there is underneath this car. So anyway, thank you, Neil, for that information and those tips. Uh, one of the things that makes these Facebook sites so valuable is there's a lot of communication like this that takes place and uh, keeps the Roadster owners up to date on what kind of aging issues we're seeing and what kind of solutions we're finding for these problems. The Roadster owners community is one of the most close-knit and enthusiastic communities of car owners that I've seen yet. Mm -hmm. um, there are, and I, I've seen a few now, uh, the, the Volvo, I'm on, I'm on a Volvo group. Um, and they're, uh, they're also, they, they're really good about sharing. It's, it, it seems to be the smaller population of right. uh, vehicles like this, because I don't see this, uh, in the model S I see this kind of, kind of collaboration, even less in model threes and model Ys. So one other item that I have for you is um, we're um, beginning to develop some of the cosmetic, uh, exterior cosmetic items for the Tesla Roadster. This one, for example, I hope you can see it, is the medallion that goes on the front. This was a China issue. And I want to caution you, although it looks great, it doesn't fit. It's about uh, a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch too wide. And there's really no easy way to trim it down to where you could make this work. But you will find these on various sites for sale. And it looks deceptive in that you might think that you can use that on the front of your Tesla Roadster. There's the, the chrome version of that same, uh, that same medallion. Um, our team here has gotten very good with carbon fiber. The, um, uh, the larger carbon fiber pieces we actually have made for us by three or four vendors mm -hmm. that are highly qualified in the, uh, in the mass production of carbon fiber here in the U.S., by the way. And, uh, but the smaller items like this we're actually making in-house, and this is a carbon fiber medallion for the Tesla Roadster. This one will fit. And we will have variations of this. This is the traditional carbon fiber weave. I don't know if we can see that. We'll have this on our e-store and we'll, we'll um, yeah, you'll have much better images then. And then this is the larger carbon fiber version of the same medallion, which some people like. And so, that one has kind of a random weave on the back as opposed to the traditional weave, correct? Yes, yep, that's, that's more of a random pattern. Um, I didn't bring them, but we have these center caps too for the uh, roadsters that are still evolving and we'll have pictures out on Facebook soon and on our e-store. Um, it looks great with a uh, black powder coated wheel with a black center cap. And if you have red uh, uh, calipers, we recommend these red tees. We have one customer that fell yeah. in love with that. It's yeah. a nice offset to the, uh, to the red calipers. Oh, it looks great. Uh, TikTok, Marinus has joined us. Um, Marinus, if you uh, would like to tell us where you're coming from, we would love to hear. Uh, he says, good evening, though, and good evening to you. YouTube, Highlander Apparel says, man, I love this show. It's always so informative. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're having fun with this. So another thing that we saw on uh, YouTube 
or no, actually Facebook. Um, <clears throat> it has to do with the uh, trunk light. And um, we recommend that when you charge your Roadster in hot climates, that you leave the trunk open because it's going to help eliminate and dissipate some of the heat that uh, builds up. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you're going to end up leaving the trunk light on. And unless it's been replaced with an LED, those original trunk lights, and it sits directly toward the back of your little uh, trunk cavity, are incandescent bulbs, and, they're, and they run hot. And there's a little plastic uh, lens that uh, covers that, and that eventually gets so hot that it melts that. Oh. So what we end up doing with every Roadster that comes in, and it's free, by the way, we have a number of complimentary services like this, we replace that incandescent bulb with an LED bulb that runs cool, and you don't have that problem anymore, and it's, and it's actually brighter as well. So in that case, you could open your trunk, leave it open, and not be concerned about melting your trunk light lens. Sure, sure. The other option that you have is there's on the left side or the driver's side in the rear, there's a small plug and socket combination by the trunk latch right next to it. We unplug those when the roadsters come in because before we've changed the LED, we don't want to melt that lens. Sure, okay. So you can unplug that. And if not having a trunk light is uh, um, uh, not important to you, then that might be one way to get around that as well. I would think as well that if somebody was wanting to maintain the um, original look and feel of the Roadster for collector's edition, mm -hmm. they would be more inclined to want to unplug the trunk light than to replace it because you want to keep right. everything original. And by the way, when we do the LED replacement for you complimentary, we always give you your incandescent bulb back if you ever wanted to reinsert it. Ah, very good, very good. All right, it's 1120. Um, we've got a few more items. Should we continue or... I don't see any new questions coming up. No new questions yet. Okay. okay. Well, maybe we can have one one more item and then wrap up. And okay. You know, it's. Uh, I know one thing that you um, that you've talked about before with the the annual maintenance and here in the hot weather, you were talking about a roadster that goes into power limiting frequently because and and you have that annual maintenance that you do. Um, and I've I've taken a tip from what you guys have talked about in the Roadster and applied it to Model S. Mm -hmm. uh, that in this case, the tip was simply, um, I'll, I'll leave the battery um, and the air conditioning running in my cabin. Because on, even on the Model S, the air conditioning, if the battery gets too hot, the air conditioning goes and helps to cool the battery instead of helping to cool the cabin. You know, here in Phoenix, we've been running 110 to 115. And uh, my car, uh, if I leave it and let it heat up, I don't have AC all the way home. And I live about 35 miles from here. Mm -hmm. If I leave it on, it cools the cabin some and it cools the battery some. And I can leave it on a charger and it, and it goes. Uh, for the Roadsters, obviously, you lift the trunk lid and you, and you exhaust with a fan. You blow the cooler air. Uh, and that's a relative term here in Phoenix. Right, right. <laughs> Uh, onto the onto the PAM and help keep it cool that way. Well, actually, that's a segue into another uh, Facebook item off of one of these uh, Facebook sites, the mm -hmm. Roadster sites. Um, here in Phoenix, I, I drove a Roadster last night again, and uh, it went into power limiting mode repeatedly, up to 62 centigrade. Uh, it's When it's 110 out, you know, these Roadsters just can't handle it. It doesn't matter which Roadster I'm driving, they're all doing that. Right. Um, but <clears throat> with the uh, with the 1.5 roadsters, they tend to be more uh, sensitive to that. I've got roadster VIN number five at home, and during summer, with a uh, with an un uh, environmentally controlled garage, um, you know, I can reach temperature of 120, 130 in that garage. So uh, number five complains constantly that the battery's too warm; it can't charge. So what I've been doing is two things. Um, I have a fan on it. And I'll show you where you can buy a fan like this. I think we have a picture of it, Jesse, if you can throw up Lasco fan. And Thomas West actually in Texas uh, recommended this particular fan. Um, what he does is he puts it underneath the Roadster and he forces air up through the battery. Um, with, with VIN number five, I actually force air down 
and that tends to keep the BSM happy. There's a battery safety management uh, temperature sensing capability inside the main ESS battery pack. And when it feels that that's out of tolerance, it will tell you the battery's too hot, you can't charge until we get this down to, you know, 0%. Sure. Um, not range, by the way, 0% <laughs> so, <laughs> heat. Um, so these fans definitely help. This is a, um, uh, you can get this on uh, Amazon. I think it's $69. It should be in the picture. There you go. Yeah, he's got the picture up. Mm -hmm. You can direct it, um, and it's it, it uh, makes a huge difference in your ability to keep charging your Roadster during the extremely hot months. Now, <clears throat> it's not just Phoenix, Arizona that we have this problem. Uh, we've got Roadster number 13 up in Las Vegas. He has yep. the same problem. Uh, he actually went as far recently as putting a... Um, a window air conditioner in and then ducting it directly to his roadster which is up on a lift um so you have to take special precautions with these roadsters they they, they were prototypes and uh, there were certain elements that weren't completely designed now you know what peter told me last night yeah he said that um in saudi arabia they had a lot of problems with heat and they actually ended up writing a special version of firmware that takes that window and opens it up just slightly to the point where uh, they don't get the power limiting problems to the extent that they used to. And this was way back in the day. So since this is a Roadster community, if any of you know about this patch or this hack, we'd love to hear about it. And uh, if that software is available, we could definitely use that here in Vegas and Phoenix, Arizona. Boy, that would be really nice because, yeah, I, I will attest as well. Now, I, I did take and make the investment and put air conditioning in my garage when I got my new house a couple of years ago. Um, it's not at all unusual prior to that. The garage I had was 120 degrees constantly throughout the summer. Mm -hmm. And if power limiting is occurring at 62 degrees centigrade, well, that's only a 20 degree differential. It's about 144 degrees. Mm -hmm. And if you're at 120 to 130, there's no room for that battery to start to heat up before you're going into power limiting mode because your, start, your starting point is at 55 degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's just mm -hmm. craziness. Uh, YouTube Highlander Apparel asks, um, I'm wondering about tires on an EV. Are they the same as ice? Fundamentally, yes. Um, what's interesting is when I first got my Roadster, um, the first batch of uh, rear tires that I had uh, needed to be replaced after 8,000 miles. Mm -hmm. and the reason for that was I couldn't keep my foot off of the joy pedal. <laughs> they don't call it a gas pedal anymore, or accelerator pedal, whatever you want to call it. So you kind of have to learn how to drive your car and become aware of the impact you have on uh, doing hard launches all the time. Um, the suggestion was, well, why don't you just go and get uh, you know, a set of new tires and get that 40,000 mile warranty? Well, the difficulty there is you have to have tire rotation periodically in order to qualify for 40,000 right. mile warranty. Right. And you can't rotate tires on a Tesla Roadster because you've got um, 18s in the back and 17s in the front. Um, so, or is it 17s and 16s? I think it's 17s and 16s, yeah, actually. Yeah, 16s, okay. Um, so anyway, um, the problem with a EV is you're going to get tire wear in two different directions. One is acceleration, the other one is during regen braking. And uh, so they don't tend to last as long as they would on an ICE vehicle. I've also heard that weight, the because electric vehicles will tend to weigh more than equivalent uh, ICE vehicles of size, um, that becomes an issue on these vehicles as well because the, the weight of the vehicle is constantly pushing that tire mm -hmm. down into the pavement, creating more friction than it would otherwise have, and it's fairly significant. Mm -hmm. um, to the point that uh, there are a number of tire manufacturers that will not warranty their tires for use on electric vehicles. They're trying to push people into a much more expensive um, a what they call electric vehicle tire now. Interesting. You know, YouTube, PYG KLB was at the uh, Tesla takeover event, and he says he spoke with a Michelin rep there, 
And uh, two differences are that the tires need to be rated for the weight and usage, just like you said. Mm -hmm. Second is the road noise is more audible, so tires are designed so noise is not as annoying. He says, I have uh, Vredestein 104 rated, nice tires. You know, they have those uh, Continental tires that have the sponge lining on the inside of the tire. Yep. And that is for noise deadening. And yeah, it, it's, uh, he's absolutely right. With an, with an ICE vehicle, you're covering up some of that noise with your engine. Right. With your engine noise. With an, with an EV, you have wind noise and, and whatever else you're picking up. Yeah, you you have you have wind noise and you have tire noise. That's pretty much uh, that's pretty much it. Because you, unless you have a, an older uh, electric motor that has had a little bit of ingress of uh, the coolant, because that coolant will tend to ingress into the motor unless the motor gets fixed, um, and then it, and then it starts to mill, and you'll hear a milling sound in your motor. Um, that's the only other noise that you t typically have on your on your electric vehicle. Right. So next week, um, oh, we've got an Instagram comment. He says, uh, so much better on YouTube. So he switched from Instagram to YouTube. And by the way, um, for those of you that want a fuller experience, yes, YouTube is generally much better supported on these streaming platforms. Um, or if one of them goes down, we do uh, broadcast on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, YouTube Shorts, YouTube. I'm probably going to leave out a few here. Oh, we've got TikTok and, of course, yeah, Instagram. TikTok. Instagram is still just the... Uh, is the green screen, although I know that the guys on the in the back here are trying to work to get that fixed as well. TikTok, apparently, we've gone uh, to actually being able to display what's on the green screen. Yes. Much improved. So in the next Roadster podcast, we've got a number of items that we didn't get to cover this time. One of them is going to be the, um, the connector blocks inside a Tesla Roadster PEM. And what we're going to do is show you next week what the 3D printed improved version is versus the original Tesla molded ABS plastic version and why we went to the great lengths of redesigning it and creating what is a better product, more durable and uh, uh, actually easier to install. Now, and for you guys that are listening this week, we will likely be asking you what these are next week without disclosing it too. So listen, we've just told you what they are, and now you have no excuses. Right. Okay, well, I think we're at a point where we can wrap here. We appreciate mm -hmm. you joining us, as always. Um, any of you that may have questions after the podcast, um, you can review this uh, live presentation on YouTube. There will be an index of topics covered that will be available to you. And, um, yeah. While we're not live on Spotify, this will also be on Spotify within a couple of hours. Um, feel free to join us tomorrow at 10 a.m., same time, uh, for the uh, Gruber Morning Show podcast. And then on Sunday, uh, you and Jesse have a lot of fun with your AI podcast. We are. We're going to um, be covering a number of interesting AI topics and uh, uh, looking for inputs from you guys as well. So thank you guys so much and take care.